now it's time for your viewing pleasure, the online show that will change how you think about online shows. Welcome to the Great I.O. Get Together! On tonight's show, fun and excitement like you won't believe. The thrills, the chills. Now join me in welcoming your hosts and mine, Richard and Tara! Thank you so much, Pete, as always. Welcome, everyone, to Great IO Get Together number six. Choose your own Fred Venture. Uh, and as Waldian Escapade. My name is Richard. This is my co host, Tara. How's it going, Tara? Not too bad. I was just uh, out hunting some cicadas before I walked in here. Oh. They are looking ripe. Preparing dinner, perhaps? I mean, if I can catch enough, apparently you have to wait until they're at the larva stage or the, the squishiest stage. I don't know. Uh, I'm pretty novice to this, but <laughs> Indiana's right in the epicenter, so I think I'm going to do did, well. did not expect you to research this question. This is, this is news to me. <laughs> the internet has a ton of cicada recipes. You'll see. It's not, this is not my invention. Wow. Well, all right. Well, well hopefully our, <laughs> our uh, viewers are not distracted by their own cicadas uh, and have joined us. For our uh, gig number six, uh, this is a live show, and it's live so that we can take questions. Uh, it's really just an excuse for our Discord community, where uh, our viewers can chat with uh, fellow IOs during the show, uh, or really anytime you want. It's uh, available all the time. Uh, you can find more details about all of that, if you haven't joined us before, at thegig.online. Uh, all of our regular shows, this one is no exception, have two halves. Uh, in our first half, we're going to have a little bit of fun. In the second half, we get a little more serious, all with our guests or guests of the day. Uh, at the top of today's gig is Would You Rather, a game of tough choices, which will be hosted by Tara. Uh, if you've never played Would You Rather, uh, the idea is that the host poses a series of either-or questions, require choosing between two alternatives, uh, and our guests will have to make a choice between them and defend their rationale. Uh, so our lucky guest today is... Dr. Fred Oswald, Herbert Autry Professor of Psychology at Rice University, past president of PSYOP in 2017, current chair of the Board of Human Systems Integration at the National Academies, uh, and multiverse-renowned expert in big data, personality, and workforce testing. Welcome to the show, Fred. Hey, thanks for having me, Richard and Tara. Hope you all are doing well. Uh, preparing cicada recipes, I see. And uh, I didn't realize I was multiverse talented, but that's uh, that's pretty great to know, actually. So thank you. Absolutely. Yeah. Very glad to be here. Uh, you have games lined up for me, apparently. We do. We'll actually be playing, do we we'll playing our game about 20, 30 minutes. Uh, and then we'll have a little bit of a chat more seriously after the break, uh, talking with you about uh, career, some tough choices you've had. Uh, are we ready to ah. get into it? Uh, Tara, you want to take us away? We are ready. Okay, so as Richard said, we are playing Would You Rather today because life is really all about tough choices. And so we're going to put some tough choices to you and hear what you think. Also, Richard, this is a surprise to you. You're playing too. So here we go. I know. You knew it was coming though. <laughs> Don't act surprised. All right. So the first question, and by the way, some of these are uh, IO psychology related. Some are not. So well, all right, here we go. First question, would you rather give a PowerPoint presentation with no words or give a presentation with no pictures. Go ahead. Oh, I'm gonna have to say no words uh, because I can, you know, impression manage around the pictures. Um, curious what Richard thinks there. I mean, yeah, that's an easy, I think that's an easy no words. Uh... You know, the I I feel I feel like the the most the most common advice I end up giving to grad students is like fewer words. So it's only a short step from there to no words. Like why not? Yeah, I agree. Well, you look, look at all the words here on the on the screen. I mean, would you want to talk through all yeah. that? No, I actually I got this image. Not. <laughs> <laughs> this is an image from a Google search for bad PowerPoint presentation. <laughs> in case you're wondering what that is. Ah, uh, uh, there, there you go. <laughs> I think I get some points then for identifying that. Yeah, to be honest, this was an easy one. I wanted you to get some confidence <laughs> uh, before we okay. dig in, but okay. uh, you know, hold on to your to your seats here. Okay, next one. Would you rather get tattoo A or tattoo B? And <laughs> oh. please note that the spelling of regret nothing is incorrect as well. So please pack <laughs> that into your decision. <laughs> wow. Wow. Uh, there's a joke about a T test there somewhere, but um, my goodness. What a choice. 
I guess <laughs> I'm going to go with concealability and pick the one on the right and never reveal that to anyone, including myself. Um, <laughs> wow. I, Richard, you know, if it was if it was the meme, if it was the no re, re, no regrets meme, then you could play it off as like obviously this was on purpose, but the knowing. Mm. No, nah, yeah, I'm gonna still say that one. I think I think you can play that one off as a uh, as purposeful. I think I could do it. Really, you're not gonna go for a belly breakfast? No, <laughs> belly breakfast. <laughs> Fascinating. We're all really right. good at psyop karaoke, is all I know in uh, 2022. So <laughs> I, I feel like the arm one all I right. could forget I had, and that belly one I would see every day, just reminding me. No, I, I yeah, definitely arm. It's true. You could never look yourself in the belly again. Yeah. All right. Would you rather start graduate school over again or have a headache for three months straight? Fred. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. This one is easy for me. I would start grad school over again. I mean, I think the implication here is that grad school is a headache. And that's true. Um, but, you know, it's it's a headache that you'll you'll always love. <laughs> um, the intellectual <laughs> headache and, you know, the struggles you have with your, your peers and your advisor and, you know, you have to manage that headache so it's not at its worst. Um, but I, I would go for grad school and starting over again. Not, not you know, would I do it better? I, I highly doubt it, but you're making me pick here, so. Wow, do the put that school. on a bumper sticker. The headache you will always love. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> Richard, do you agree? Uh, I think I'm. I think I'm gonna pull an IO here and say it depends. Like I don't. No. I, I don't uh. know what start over again means. Like start over again at this age. Start over knowing what I know now, or literally turn back time. Those are slightly different for me. Ooh. Ooh. Good question. Oh. I did not think about mm. that. I guess I was imagining that it means your career is wiped clean. You have to start over from scratch and. It could be in any field, actually. I didn't, you know, it doesn't have to be Iowa psychology. Mm. Ooh. At, at this age, or is this like a full redo? Yep. No, no, no time oh, machine involved. Mm. You know, there's a saying here, uh, I suppose. Um, there, there are many ways to do grad school, but there's only one way to have a headache. <laughs> is, that, is that pretty deep? What do you think? I don't think that's a sentence. I mean, no one's ever said that oh, before. You right, right. That. Totally new. Totally new. Fresh. <laughs> Fresh content. So I, on YouTube. I, I mean, so starting <laughs> starting fresh at this age would definitely be longer than three months, and I'm pretty sure I could medicate myself heavily enough for three months that I wouldn't mind. So I'm gonna I'm gonna Ooh. vote headache. Fascinating. So wow. your plan is to basically sleep for three months and then wake up having having skirted the issue entirely. That's very clever. <laughs> Don't very do that clever. in grad school. Is all I gotta say. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> all right. Would you rather find a dead body in an alley or shovel a ton of coal? Did David Lickin say this? This is, so this question comes from one of our loyal readers or watchers. And this was one of David Lickin's um, personality, force choice personality questions. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. Also, side note, that is his Wikipedia picture. And I just aspire to have a picture <laughs> that cool of me ever. Um, so. <laughs> I, I I met him while in grad school. Um, he he did not uh, bring a pipe into the building, as far as I know. But um, wow, good question. I'm going to go with the ton of coal. I mean, I think there's a fitness benefit there um, that I. It's greater than any any benefit from finding finding a dead body. I mean, what are you going to do there? There are a lot of nothing. You know, I guess you could carry it to the morgue but no really there's no exercise benefit in that that's true richard yeah. richard mm. oh, cool. <laughs> clearly I'm really, I'm now very curious about construct well, here. Uh, I, I think would, the question I, is, I would, would you be grossed you out by that enough to traumatize yeah, you? Or, or, in, in, I'm also intrigued by the response of, oh, clearly we'd have to amazing. bring it to a morgue. See, I've learned a lot about your personality uh, I, today. I think I would just <laughs> walk away or call some authorities. and that would the Personality test of some sort. Quickly. 
<laughs> personality? What do you mean? Oh, no. <laughs> you know, Dave, 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 Lickin's picture, <laughs> Dave Lickin's picture is kind of a distractor here so for is, this so question, you know? I keep staring at him. I can't. I can't think through this question any further. <laughs> I know. You just think like, what do I have to do to oh, oh, cool. be as cool oh, as this guy? Yeah. I agree. Right. <laughs> yeah. I don't know. He'd probably shoveled a ton of coal. That's my guess. All right. Moving on. Would you rather live in a world with no mediators wow. or no moderators? Wow. Wow. <laughs> um, okay. I see a couple typos in the figure. I could, if that's a quiz. Um, but... Uh, <laughs> I'm gonna go with I'm gonna go with no mediator just because no, I'm gonna change my mind. I'm gonna say no moderators. I'm no gonna go moderators. with the statistical power argument. Yeah, no, no <laughs> moderators. Oh, so you're coming at it from a statistical power argument. Yeah, a little tougher to find. And and also this is like moderated mediation and I'm you know, that three month headache <sighs> is uh, starting up here just looking at that. <laughs> You might recognize this figure from every paper ever. Um, <laughs> Richard. <laughs> I mean, interpret it how you wish, really. I was thinking of my uh, world, right, right, world of so, analysis. Okay, but so, so good, good clear, point, Richard. Like You're pulling us into reality. Not that they um, existing, <laughs> yes. possibly. Very helpful. <laughs> oh. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I mean a world wow, so a world without mediators no, would be complete No chaos. no personalization of any of, of medicine. I mean, Everyone gets the same treatment. That that's be. so I I'd have to say the no moderators would be the world I'd live in. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Yeah, these aren't fair questions. That's the point of the game. Okay, I'm next. Call, I'm going to call versus, Richard like versus main total effect chaos, Richard yes, from now on. Like... <laughs> oh, it's main effect guy. All right, Fred, this is a very <laughs> serious question. Would you rather fight one Scott Tony Dandel Ooh. sized duck or 20 duck sized Scott Tony Dandels? Uh, <laughs> oh. You know, I think I think one Scott sized duck because look at the 20 there. They're just I mean, there's no way you could conquer those. No way. There would be you thought you got them all and the 20th one is, you know, behind your back. You just missed it. No, and exactly. He's sneaky. You can't I want to see him. the duck. One duck. One Scott-sized duck. I mean, that here is. it is. Right here. One duck. It's... <laughs> what about a duck-sized Scott? Hmm. You know, you have to fight Full 20 duck-sized Scots. Those... You can't just fight one. That's Ooh. obviously what everyone would choose. Mm. Yeah. But... You need to fight 20. 20. Yeah. So like the total mass of the two creatures is, is basically equal. It's just... Yeah, yeah, true, true. Yeah, the, the duck size Scots, that's <laughs> exactly. like right hamster I mean, level. That's a dangerous. Uh, just imagine and, uh... the chaos that could cause to your ankles and hamstrings. No good. <laughs> I wish Scott were here. Yeah, he did get his approval for this question, just to be oh, clear. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay, moving on. <laughs> Would you rather utilize the word utilize or leverage the word leverage in a paper cycle? <laughs> ooh, ooh. You're asking the right person. Um, I'm going to have to go with leverage because I despise utilize. And I'll leave it at that. Richard? I think I heard that somewhere. Uh, <laughs> uh, I, I don't agree. I mean, leverage at least can mean something more often uh utilize is such, there's such a narrow use case for where it is actually right. appropriate i think leverage would be would be yeah I would what is other word? I, i'm more curious about this full list yeah here though this yes is a, so this is serious. Um, people who know me well know that i have a long list of hated words and here they are for your viewing pleasure uh they just they make my hair stand up on end um and utilize and leverage are both on there however you're right that leverage can be a noun and then it's fine like you can have leverage uh, but it cannot be a verb, and I will die on that hill. So, um, anyway, everyone, please I'm, screenshot this list and file it away somewhere handy. Because very it's like you did a deep dive on this list to become a guru. <laughs> uh, high potential. She's really moving the needle. Please again. stop! You're hurting me. <laughs> <laughs> 
I'm, Lots of I'm, verbiage here. I'm baffled that triple bottom line is a thing. I can't even imagine what that means. Whoa. Whoa. Yeah, I don't even, I don't know what the first, the second one is, frankly, but that's okay. All right. <laughs> are we ready to move on? It's cracks, this triple bottom line. Yeah, moving on. Sorry. Yeah, that sorry. resonates with me, too. Let's. Yeah. <laughs> this, I regret this list very much. It's, it's unpleasant to look at, really. Oh, do okay. You wanna, do you want to unpack Would that? you rather live a year as Fred Flintstone or Fred Astaire or bonus Fred Durst? <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, Fred Flintstone is, I, I think, I mean, look at the tongues wagging there. That's like the simple <laughs> life. I'm. I'm going to go for that. I don't, I, I think there are pluses and minuses uh, to every lifestyle I see here. I, I'm probably stereotyping the real complexity of their lives, but I'm going to go with the Flintstones and hang out with Barney. Yeah. I mean, look at the size of that steak. To <laughs> look at that. Uh, no wonder their tongues are wagging. <laughs> Richard. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I'm actually not totally clear who Fred Durst is. Uh, but I will. What? <laughs> <laughs> looks he looks like a like a great guy. Uh, but I'd go a stare. I like I like the glamour. I'd do that. Fred yeah, Durst has done everything, right? I guess. I mean, he he he's like a singer. I couldn't tell you where he's sung, but he's like a rapper, and he directed films, and he's just been present for a long time. That. That's the extent of my knowledge, but I thought we were talking about Fred Astaire for a second. I was like, really? Oh, Fred, Fred Astaire is a rapper? That's no, 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 Fred Astaire. <laughs> and Ginger yeah, Rock. Fred Durst is the lead singer of um a band, Limp Biscuit, I think. It's oh, Limp Biscuit. That's yes. what yeah. Okay. Yeah. All right. But yeah, I think Fred Flintstone's the obvious choice here. I mean, sure you give up some things in Thank modern you. technology, but what did technology ever do for anybody, really? I don't I don't like my stakes that blue. <laughs> did you draw that tara <laughs> no that's, that's an actual screen grab all right next question would you rather oh this is another uh, uh viewer submission would you rather defend phrenology as a selection tool or start every opening plenary at the conference by leading the group in the cupid shuffle wow <laughs> wow you know for the sake of Saving the world, I'm going to go with the Cupid Shuffle. I'm just not going to promote phrenology in any setting that affects. Um, that is so pro social and kind I of. I mean, you. yeah, it's a real act of sacrifice. I know. Yeah, amazing. Richard. Uh, it's like a, like a legit defense, is the question. Yeah, like seriously, oh, like no, in no, a no, court. No. In a court, oh yeah, yeah in definitely a court. not gonna do not gonna do that. Yeah, def definitely Cupid shuffling. I guess it might uh, kill me a little are... bit every time, but <laughs> I don't even know what the Cupid shuffle is. So I may have just subscribed to something really terrible. <laughs> so it turns out I didn't know what it was either. But when I googled it, I found many pictures of this kind of thing. So I think it's one of those group dances that people do at parties. Um, I forgot what parties are really, but anyway, it's a it's an embarrassing <laughs> dance. We'll just leave. They it all that. seem pretty happy. I mean, huh. more or yeah. less. Sure. Yeah. Right. Would you rather write a paper that directly refuted one of your own earlier papers, or give a TED talk? <laughs> <laughs> I am perfectly fine directly refuting one of my earlier papers, and would rather do that to giving a TED talk. Yes. I would totally do that. That uh, is a true scientist answer. I just want to beat other people to the punch, right? Just go ahead and oh. negate my work. Mm. See, this is why you're a multiverse renowned national treasure. <laughs> right, right. <laughs> <laughs> Richard. Uh, I'm actually good with either of these. Uh, I. Huh. I guess I would prefer to give a TED talk as long as I had control of the TED talk. Uh, oh no, nobody has control over their TED talk. <laughs> so forget yeah, that. I, yeah. yeah, it depends on what within the full like TED revision infrastructure and all the weird stuff they do, I'd be nervous. But I think I would I would rather do it. I I mean I've I've partially refuted things that I've already written already. It's that's mm -hmm. yeah, it's just part of the process, you know. Yeah, uh, I refute things you've already written all the time. It's easy. Oh thanks. Yeah. Right. Right. <laughs> <laughs> uh 
I've read those things, Tara. They're great. Yeah, I thought so too. Thanks. <laughs> you know, this is forced choice. So, I mean, I would give a TED Talk if you actually, you know, hadn't, if I had to sit and think about it, I'd give a talk about selection and hope that someone listens. I mean, I'd, I'd ask Richard to co-present so that we get more, more wisdom in there. But That's very practical. I like yeah. it. All right. Would you rather be on every departmental committee well, for a year or be a vegan for a year? And please note the sad face in the salad, which <laughs> is really driving the point. Oh, home. I noticed that right away. I think there's a there isn't there a disorder that's like pareidolia or so where you see figures oh. in random shapes. This yeah. is it. I mean, it just popped okay. out at me like <laughs> sad face. I would be a vegan forever as opposed to being on every committee. I would yeah. eat I would eat nails for a year. <laughs> <laughs> Richard, how many nails would you eat to avoid being on tomorrow? I, I would not I would I don't think I would I would eat any nails. I would I would go vegan forever if it meant never having to go to any other committee meeting ever again. Like that's that's a totally worthwhile trade off for me. <laughs> wow. I don't I don't understand why they're sleeping in this meeting. I mean, most departmental meetings are quite the opposite. Much more lively. That's true. Yeah. There's usually more fisticuffs. I, uh... Yeah, where are the chairs <laughs> being thrown? Like, what's... It's not realistic <laughs> at all. I mean, there's some data <laughs> analytics on the wall to keep you entertained. That... Nobody's crying. I mean, this is a very unrealistic picture. <laughs> Agreed. <laughs> all right. Would you rather... Oh, sorry. Whoa. So you now have Whoa. a clone... Would you rather make your clone finish all your unfinished papers or answer all your unanswered emails? Whoa, there's there's a uh, uh, mystic Fred there on the left. Um, <laughs> and then there's there's breezy Fred on the right. Yeah. Um, West Coast, East Coast, really. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to go for those papers. I mean, emails, they they I don't even know if it's possible to answer them all. But, you know, these are theory questions. I'm going to go with the papers. Yeah, I mean, emails can just resolve themselves, really. <laughs> Not answering them is a resolution. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> wait, yeah. So Richard. you you wait. So you'd make your clone finish your papers, and then you just still wouldn't answer the emails. Like you would just take a take some time off, is what you would do. Yes, totally, that is correct. Totally. <laughs> that that task okay. goes undone. <laughs> <laughs> I see. Yeah. No, I I actually don't. I don't really. I'm one of those like inbox zero people. So I really. Always, what? Yeah, I answer all emails. I don't always do the what? thing that I need to do, but I answer all the emails. So I already it's definitely papers. Like that's that's the only unfinished thing. Aren't I your aren't your emails like a to do list, like with about twelve hundred to dos? Mine are. Yeah. Uh, yeah. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> I, I do the whole like schedule to pop up later, and then I schedule time in for emails to reappear when I need to answer them. And wow. What? Yeah. Who are you? You are right. Do you use one of Tara's words? A guru of productivity. <laughs> or a ninja, Ethan. <laughs> a ninja. You, well, you've reached the triple bottom line of productivity. What I'm learning is that, uh, Fred, you and I each need to write Richard 100 emails. So oh. let's do that. Just <laughs> never get him in about zero. With exactly. Various tasks that he needs to do. <laughs> all right. Would you rather do away with all selection and testing or all training? Ooh, wow. Mm -hmm. What a paralyzing question. Hmm. Yeah. What a paralyzing question. I told you they wouldn't stay easy forever. Wow. I th I'm afraid, despite what I do, I would say get rid of selection and testing. I mean, you know, training, everybody can improve through interventions. And um, there's just a lot, a lot of opportunity to grow through training. So that's my answer. I, I mean, t you really did ramp up the difficulty here. Oh, yeah. This is like cutting right to the core of the philosophy of what we do. All right, so you're going with training. Interesting. Did not predict that, Richard. Uh, yeah, I would. I would definitely. Well, wait. So selection testing. Does that mean testing outside of selection also? Like a hundred. No, it testing? means like we just hire people randomly from now on. There we go. Okay. <laughs> yeah, then I would definitely get rid of selection <laughs> testing because because I mean one, I think that would be a fairer world, and we still have assessment post training. So I don't. Yeah, I don't. I think that'd be fine. Talk about the investment you'd really want to make. Ooh, yeah, uh, if you did random selection. I mean, th this really is a hard question. But 
You know, it wasn't hard at all for me when I looked at this question, which surprised me because I too was like, yep, definitely need training more than selection, which really kind of shocked me. Didn't think I would say that, but of course they're both good and they're both valuable, but. You know, it's these thought experiments that help us grow. And I, I never thought I would grow on gig here, but uh, thank you so much. This is really, what we do here. Yeah, yeah you're yeah, forcing choices. It's what you're doing. All right, we are at our last question. Fred, this one is just for you. Oh my. You're playing Nigel Richards in Scrabble. Oh. And oh. you can choose one letter that he can't use. Which letter will you choose? Wow. 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 I'm just impressed with this question. First of all, I'm just honored. <laughs> I'm kind of basking in this question for a minute. <laughs> I think I'm gonna have to go with E because there there are like 12 of them. So, you know, just prohibiting him from using a letter that appears frequently in the language and that there's a lot of them in the bag tile bag i think uh i think i would do that and i think he would still beat beat me he's just the best nigel richards if you so, don't know studio <laughs> audience nigel richards is the best look him up so richard suspected that i sh he said i shouldn't ask this question because there was probably a technically good technically correct answer and that you would know it <laughs> So he said not to ask it, but it turns out there is one. <laughs> well, you know, maybe, maybe. I mean, you, you, Nigel has a lot of tricks, so you just, you just don't know with that guy what letter is going to work for you. I would suspect. That's but, true. Um, Didn't he famously win French Scrabble despite not speaking French? That was the yes. That was the little factoid I was going to share, and you seem to know it. And he, <laughs> he also he he learned he memorized the French Scrabble dictionary in like I don't know like two months or something. It was a super short period of time, and then he went on to win the national tournament in France. That is wild. Imagine That's the hero that. we all need. Just imagine that. <laughs> All right, well, we are at the end of our game, and usually at the end of the game, you declare a winner. So I declare Fred the winner of Would You Rather. Yes. Well done. Thank you so much. Thank you. I will take your your compliment, um, your your award of being on gig is the award, I suppose. Um, yeah. This is really great. Sorry, Richard, next time I don't, I don't you'll get to play again, I'm sure, one day. I didn't, they didn't, nobody even asked me the Scrabble question. I told you this one's just for Fred. I don't care I which letter you just pick. Just for me. Oh, maybe, that's <laughs> maybe that's why I won. I won't, I won't question that though. I'll just take the win. <laughs> yeah. That's for the best. Yeah. All right. What do we do now, Richard? <laughs> oh, I guess I'll walk us out. Uh, Cause we're, we have a, a five minute break and we'll come back and then uh, then ask some more tough questions. I don't I don't know if any be, any will be Scrabble related or not though. I don't know. Oh, they're all Scrabble related. Oh, they're Every all. Every single oh. one is Scrabble related, actually. Oh, great. Well, then we'll all look forward to that. See you in five minutes. Right. <laughs> awesome. We'll be right back after these messages from our sponsors. And we're back. Welcome everyone. Uh, Tara, I have no I have nothing to say. We're right back to you again. Well, how about that? Okay, Fred. So the first half of the show, we had some fun, played a little game, but now things will get more serious. So uh, the theme of today's gig is tough choices. So I'm going to ask you some interview questions about tough choices that you've faced and, and ask you for some advice going forward in the world. So are you ready? Wow. Okay. All right. All right. Let's see what kind of wisdom I can impart. Okay. I, I suspect that you're full of wisdom. If any. So. Yeah. So for the first question... I'm going to set it up like a behavioral interview question. Uh -huh. So the format should be familiar to you. So tell me about a time that you struggled with a career decision. So tell me what the situation was. What did you do? What was the result? You know, classic behavioral interview technique. My goodness. So really just a general question. <laughs> career struggle. Um, you know, I did have the kind of classic struggle a graduate student has with um, applied research versus academia, that sort of fork in the road that I, as psychologists, often face in graduate school, and uh, trying to weigh the pros and cons while 
not really having the benefit of experience on both of those uh, forks in the road or both of those those branches. So you just have to go down one, right? Uh, with some uh, some weak prediction. And I had done some applied work in graduate school with um, consulting and billable hours, I guess, uh, that kind of idea um, with projects. And then um, I also was involved in teaching and and research and you know, it was a it was a tough choice, but I think the the autonomy of academia won out at the end of the day. Um, not that you can't exercise your talents and and autonomy in the in the applied world as well, and that's what made it so tough is the fact you can. Um, but I really um, figured that that academia would be uh, right for me and helping others develop uh, research skills and and our science uh, within IO psychology. So I could uh, I could go on, Tara, but I, I think I'm just painting a basic uh, dilemma that I faced, and yeah, I'm glad so I made the decision I made. Sounds like you just had to take a leap at some point because both paths were potentially appealing. Did you did you talk to other people? How did you go about collecting information to make that decision? Yeah, great great question. I mean, a lot of it. I think the the most influential part. Um, was in some ways the firsthand experiences and and uh, you know actually being engaged in projects where I mean it's not that you didn't have input from other people because you were working with other people on these projects so so it's not to say that I learned on my own I would ask these people I worked with on applied projects what is it like to work on other projects and um, why do you find your job valuable and and things like that and I do the same thing on the on the academic side as well, uh, whether it was senior graduate students or other faculty, or you kind of, you know, you're kind of watching what other faculty are doing and getting that indirect information too, that um, they like to drink a lot of coffee, um, you know, they, they walk around a lot, uh, they, they, they stare into space, um, you know, like I wanted knocking. to do a lot of that. So, um, you know, I, 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 I can't say that I did a, a formal job analysis of kind of the those roads. Um, perhaps I should have given what I learned in graduate school, but um, I did not. And um, here I am today on gig, so. Well, it looks like your career has been wildly successful from my point of view. And so do you feel like that was the right choice or are you kind of sleeping at night wishing you were a consultant? No, no regrets, Tara. No regrets whatsoever. <laughs> Um, <laughs> Regret nothing, I believe, is the expression, but right, with no right. tea, right? <laughs> no tea, right. <laughs> right, right. I'm having belly breakfast uh, every morning. Uh, so, yeah, um, no regrets. I mean, you know, there's always a road less traveled, but um, I have been very fortunate uh, to work with really great people and learn from them. And, um, you know, I... I just, uh, you know, people have been very generous with their time. I think you, we all have experienced that at SIOP. You see these people are really into what they're doing and they're into supporting you. And I've benefited from that and I hope to benefit other people. It sounds really cheesy, but we live in this luxury world where we get to explore and, and uh, you know, have an impact. So I can't complain. And, um, you know, as you can tell, I don't, I don't want to brag, but I have a house and I eat food every day, um, so Whoa. I'm healthy. I'm moderately healthy, um, you know. So life is good. Well, and it, like I said before, it's just been a wildly successful career by any metric. I think one of the challenges that I experience in academia is sort of unlimited choices about what to work on and when to work on it. So, how do you approach that that very difficult task of choosing which projects to work on and which ones not to work on, and which people to work with and which people not to work with? Yeah, I I wish I could tell you I was incredibly strategic with all aspects of my life. Uh, choosing a career you asked about, and I wasn't terribly strategic. Even even choosing a graduate school was a little bit uneven and um, and even when it comes to projects there's um, you know there's a there's a reasonable scope of decision making of you know who do I like to work with and which projects are going to have an impact or or not impact even that sounds too strategic which projects are interesting and feasible and um, you think it, you think people will appreciate reading it and and uh, benefit from it. So it's it's um, 
it's it's a hazy it's not a it's not a strict calculus but um those are the kind of instincts i go off of um you know conversely we all you know i don't know maybe maybe some people view it as there being some trade-offs about um everybody has personalities right i'm i'm as it turns out not a perfect uh, personality and you know so you do develop relationships with people over time where um there there are quirks right but you just you just have to find those relationships where you, you trust each other and and the work is fun and productive and you know you have to work through that sometimes so you don't always get it right away um does this help at all? Um. <laughs> I think so. I mean, what I'm hearing you say is a little bit of trial and error and yeah. a little bit of looking for collaborators and projects that um, sort of align with your values, right? So people who you can trust and who you can count on, but that also are interested in making an impact in the same way that you are and uh, sort of see the world through similar lenses. Although I suppose you could argue that working with someone that you totally disagree with could be really interesting too. Right. Yeah, adversarial <laughs> collaboration, uh, they call it, right? Or also, I guess one thing I would add that's, uh, I guess, Fred-like would be um, that I, I have a breadth of interest. So I, I definitely appreciate people who have really deep expertise in one area and they, they really mind it and have advanced the field because of that uh, understanding that literally no one else has um, in terms of what they're doing and, and where they're going, where the future is. I don't know if I'm necessarily that kind of person. I, I I see breadth and I see connections between ideas, and I you know I think there are, I'm so I'm biased in thinking there's a benefit from that approach as well. But I think that has guided my work. Also, it it made it hard to get tenure in in the sense that um, I wasn't the person that did X, right? I was a person that did uh, a few different things, and you know you have to package that. And I guess any tenure package is, is a story about why you should get tenure. But um, mine was about breadth and the connection between the things I was doing. Yeah, I recently, or a long time ago, actually read a paper in defense of dabblers, the idea that, um, you know, your interests might change as you, as new ideas occur to you, or as the as society around you changes and you pursue new new problems. Um, and you're right, historically or traditionally in academia, that isn't as valued as someone who is just, you know, beating the same drum for 40 years. But I think that that the world needs more dabblers, frankly. And and I think uh, there's a new book, uh, David Epstein, um, mm -hmm. uh, Range, you know, making mm -hmm. the same argument and, you know, talking about... Uh, Jack of all trades, master than master of none. The second half of that quote is oftentimes better than master of one. Right. So, mm -hmm. so sometimes it's just a good thing to be skilled in lots of areas. I mean, personally, I've I've just enjoyed it. That's the only reason. I mean, if you were to give a strategic statement around it, you would say like, oh, well, just like in the stock market, you have to diversify your portfolio to hedge yourself against risk, right? You don't want to invest in in uh, solar umbrellas and then no one wants a solar umbrella anymore, <laughs> um, right? So, um, but but I, I have not been strategic that way. I've just really have enjoyed um, that breadth. Um, I think it makes me, um, you know, good at some things and not, not great at others. But I think a good thing that I'm good at is editing and seeing seeing that breadth and, and um, also uh, engaging in multidisciplinary work, you know, where, where you kind of see where some connections are and try and communicate that to people. So if you only have one base to work off of, it's hard to, it might be harder to connect people to that base potentially. Um, so um, yeah, go ahead. Absolutely. Well, I mean, that's a, that's a really helpful perspective. Can, um, I, okay. I, I, Next I, I want you to. Oh, Richard. Oh, Richard's yeah. talking. Richard's yeah, talking. I, I, I can't wanna... see you. <laughs> I want to I actually want to just pick up on a point that it, I think would be surprising to some early career and grad student listeners that you weren't sure of your tenure case. Can you <laughs> <laughs> elaborate on that? Well, I can't say I was um, unsure, but I wasn't confident. I wasn't. Mm. Um, I think what helped was the support I had at uh, Michigan State for 
getting into the translation between your work and making the case for your work where, where, hmm. you know, if you're not doing just one thing that it can be a little bit hard to do. So like, you know, Steve Kozlowski, Amory Ryan, um, Rick Deshawn, they all gave me feedback on Neil Schmidt. They all gave me some feedback on how to kind of take what you're, you know, so I did work and I do work in selection, right? So you could talk about the, the impact selection has in the world, right? Employment testing across large industries and, you know, military, how selection is related to education, the impact it has there. And then that's sort of a, a core then that leads into the individual differences work I've, I've been doing in situational judgment tests and uh, personality measurement, and then uh, sort of the methodological work supporting it. So it, they, they helped me orient um, the work I was doing. Is and that, a, that made me feel better. The social support that I got with that made me feel better too. So is that not something that you thought about before like year five or was this <laughs> a long-term problem? I got to say, I did not, I enjoyed research. I did not, th I thought about tenure in sort of a broad sense, but I didn't, I didn't really think about what do I have to do? I need to do X to get tenure in any, except for writing, I mean, writing papers, but you know, you can write papers in so many different ways. So I was more engaged in, the, in that aspect. I will not say, I mean, I was as, um, I guess insecure as anybody going up for tenure. I, I didn't. I didn't want to. It's not as if I had a backup uh, career plan or that I would launch into right away or or things like that. But um, hmm. yeah. So I'm incredibly happy to hear you say that you never use tenure as a decision making criteria to choose projects. I think everybody should really pay attention to that. Um, and that, I mean, it doesn't lead to good work when you're only focused on this, this kind of short-term metric. Well, so I, I don't want to say I did random selection, but I, but I'll <laughs> say that, um, you know, you find areas in the field that interest you and, um, work with work, work in an area where other people have worked. And that gives you some indication that you're in the ballpark, right? So I, I definitely want people to see that you, you know, you look for fertile ground, but you don't necessarily need to be wedded to the path some imagined path to tenure which i think is what you're getting at tara is like some some magic prescription um and and it, it can be constraining it can be um it can take some of the fun out of it i would say mm. totally um okay so i want you to think just from your position as a, a you know a leader of the field of io someone who is very tapped into the big issues that we're facing as io psychologists and what, in your sense, are some of the tough choices that we have to face in the next five to 10 years? Hmm. You ask the toughest questions here on gig. I did uh, warn you. I just would like to point that out. <laughs> can't Richard play with me now? <laughs> no. Nope. Sorry. Um, so, I don't know. I I think there, there are a few different concerns that we all um, face, um, whether we think about it directly every day or not. Um, one is one is about the IO ecosystem as a discipline within psychology. So IO psychology is connected to um, organizational behavior in the business school, right? Which um, they, are um, training pure academics. Um, you wouldn't think of that, not necessarily, I mean, a lot of people wouldn't believe that because it's a business school, wouldn't they go into business? No, they're pure academics. So that's, and that's one area, right, where, um, you know, you've got um, people applying there to graduate school for whatever reasons, they don't know about IO psychology or the stipend is better and when you, when you go to grad school, um, you also have the pipeline from of faculty, right? When you might graduate with a degree in IO and try to get uh, a business school job um, because people love business. No, no, people love money. People love business. I don't know. Uh, but for whatever reason, <laughs> uh, folks are taking jobs there and that's part of the ecosystem. And so I don't think there's a brain drain necessarily. I just think there's that system 
we need to be thinking about and how IO psychologists are, um, are training practitioners. And there's huge benefit of that in the PhD programs and in these master's programs. There's some online programs coming up where um, those are, you know, we, we have an educational ecosystem we need to attend to there. I would love to have more IO psychology in a, your Harvard, Yale, you know, Ivy League schools. Um, I think we're all biased in thinking we are um, important within psychology and, and certainly have a legitimate space in the most uh, selective colleges and so on. Um, and I would love for us to attend to that issue in the next five to 10 years. I think that would be that would be huge for the field is to focus on education and training and think about that larger ecosystem. Um, well, here again, your true love of training is coming out. We're learning <laughs> right. so much about you. <laughs> yeah. It's fascinating. Okay, so I want to ask you one last question today. It's a little bit different because there's not exactly a tough choice involved. But I showed you, you know, we did a, a forced choice question from David Lycan earlier. And when I was doing some research, I found out that he has a law, Lycan's law, and I'll read it. It's the quality of one's intellectual productions is a function of the product of talent times mental energy. And although there are lots of varied tests for assessing intelligence, there is no attempt to measure individual differences in mental energy. Um, and then I went further down the rabbit hole and I found out that lots of my other favorite thinkers also have laws. So Kevin Kelly, who you know was the creator of Wired and a, a major tech thinker, mm -hmm. his law is power, understanding, control, pick any two. Mm -hmm. And Marvin Minsky is words should be your servants, not your masters. So my question to you is, what's your law? Oh. <laughs> <laughs> I wish I could tell you, Tara. Let's see. Um, drink coffee every morning is a pretty good law um, that that I live by. Um, live every day like it's last. I don't really have a law. Um, I, there, is a, there is an existing law that I live by. Um, it's called Cole's Law. Have you heard What's of that? What's that? So Cole's Law is a side dish consisting primarily of shredded uh, raw cabbage. A <laughs> little vinaigrette thrown in there. <laughs> thank you thank you very much i should have expected that well done friend yeah, I'll be performing in the tri-county area this summer uh stop by time. well with that that brings us to the end of our interview today fred thank you so much for joining us this has been really enlightening and educational and also pretty fun thank you <laughs> Y'all are the best. I really enjoyed uh, being with y'all. I love the gig uh, series, and I'll be watching more of it in the future. So thank you. Thank you. All right. That's it for gig hey. number six. Oh, you can still hear you, Fred. And then you're not oh. visible right now. Oh, that's a mystery. Bye, everybody. <laughs> Bye, everybody. Uh, as always, please join our Discord so that you can chat with us before, during, and after the show. Definitely hit subscribe and YouTube. Get a notification the next time we go live so that you never miss a show. Uh, thank you so much for joining us, as well as Fred in the background. Uh, and we'll see you next time for another great IO get-together. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs> oh, the times were hard and the wages low. Leave a Johnny, leave a I guess it's time for us to go And it's time for us to leave her Leave a Johnny, leave her Oh, leave a Johnny, leave her For the voyage is done and the winds don't blow And it's time for us to leave her I can't believe it's already over. Can you? To keep the excitement going, check out our website at thegig.online. Join our Discord community to chat with your hosts and your fellow giggers. Subscribe to our YouTube channel so that you never miss a gig. Above all, thank you for joining us, and see you next time for another great I.O. get-together.